Corruption is costly in a variety of different ways. Most of the world actually lives in corrupt countries, and in these places, buildings will literally fall down because they're poorly constructed. The average Kenyan is estimated to pay 16 bribes a month. In contrast, the average Dane may not pay a bribe in their entire life. Now, corruption seems like it's a breakdown in cooperation. But in fact, corruption is cooperation. My background is in human evolutionary biology, and we've been studying cooperation for a very, very long time. Animal cooperation and human cooperation. And the key to understanding corruption may actually be found in biology. In 2005, Science Magazine listed its 125 big questions for the coming decade. And one of those questions was the question of cooperation. How is it that humans have achieved large-scale cooperation? JBS Haldane was asked the question, would you save a brother? And he said, I wouldn't save a brother, but I'd save two brothers or eight cousins. And later on, Bill Hamilton formalized this idea when he developed the E equals MC squared of, of evolutionary biology. The relatedness, RB is greater than C, that is the relatedness multiplied by the benefit has to be greater than the cost. And this, what we call inclusive fitness or kin selection, explains why it is that we love our families and we favor our families at the expense of others. So as long as genes can identify and favor copies of themselves, then those genes will spread. You can get a little further using what's called direct reciprocity or peer punishment. So as long as we both know each other and we can't really escape the consequences, then if you screw me over, like if you steal my crops, I know exactly who you are and I'm gonna come and get you. You can go a little bit further uh, using indirect reciprocity or reputation. So here, I don't know who you are and you don't know who I am, but I know all of you. I know the groups that you run and I know about your reputation. So in this case, if you screw me over, I will ruin your reputation. I'll tell everyone what you did and then no one else will want to cooperate with you. This is very different to the kind of large scale anonymous cooperation that we enjoy in the modern world, where I can walk into a grocery store and I can buy goods, not feeling like I'm going to get ripped off or the quality of those goods are going to be terrible. And the reason that I can get away with that is because we have institutions that do the punishing for us. We have courts, a judiciary, and a police force that will find and prevent people from breaking the rules. We have uh, institutions that protect property rights so that when I go to McDonald's, I know that I'm actually getting McDonald's and it's not someone who's just kind of set up their own golden arches. So the trouble is, those other scales, those lower order scales of cooperation are always present. And in fact, they're easier to sustain than is the kind of large scale anonymous cooperation that we enjoy in the West. When a government minister gives a contract to his cousin, we have a term for this, it's nepotism. And it is nepotism, but it's also inclusive fitness undermining institutional punishment. If somebody gives a job to someone they know or someone they know of, they're using direct or indirect reciprocity at the expense of the meritocracy. It is clear, though, that some nations have been able to keep corruption at bay. So how is it that some countries are able to do this and other countries are not? Transparency may not be a panacea to solving corruption. It may be necessary to bring transparency or accountability hand in hand with other things, like increasing economic potential or uh, you know, increasing the power of the state to actually uh, prevent people from engaging in corruption. Human evolution endowed us with a certain psychology and so certain societal structures such that our different societies can compete against each other. Different societies, different cities, different ways of doing things are constantly competing. A democracy versus more autocratic rule. When societies are in competition with each other, say economic competition with each other, this can actually help suppress these lower order scales of cooperation because the societies that are able to suppress this will survive and will succeed at the expense of the societies that are unable to do this. So ironically, the situation in many countries might be that there isn't enough competition against their neighbors. You can use the same perspective to think about other common problems. An autocracy in many ways is a tight-knit group of people cooperating, so generals, politicians, and so on, cooperating together at the expense of the people. So they're cooperating to suppress the people. If you're providing aid to these countries, uh, then you're supplying the leader with the resources to maintain their kind of lower order scale of cooperation via, for example, direct reciprocity against a population that is unable to coordinate in order to cooperate at a scale enough to depose the leader. So competition, at least group level competition, what we call cultural group selection, might be what it takes to suppress corruption and might be what it takes to reach this kind of large-scale anonymous cooperation, successful institutions the world over.